On this edition of Sightings, what's the British military hiding? Two army helicopters approached us and appeared to be harassing us. Startling videotape reveals the truth behind crop circle formations. Then, is the human race the result of an extraterrestrial experiment? We are the direct descendants of the intelligent people who landed here. Also, dangerous entities are terrorizing this hotel. It's even possible these people don't know that they're dead. Plus, a young girl's premonition turns to tragedy. She drew that picture. She knew she was going to die. And... It was exactly the kind of signal that we were looking for. It's a narrow band signal, clearly of intelligent origin. Have we made contact with a civilization from another galaxy? Finally, an update. The sculptor whose psychic vision helps families find missing loved ones. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. The ancient hamlet of Avebury in southwestern England is the site of two distinctly different supernatural events. In the Avebury area, more than 300 crop circles have been discovered since 1990. And then there are the bizarre glowing orbs that locals have dubbed the Avebury mystery lights. The two phenomena seemed unrelated until recently, when videotape was shot showing what appears to be a glowing ball of light actually creating a crop circle. That is what you look at. This is a military helicopter circling the field in Avebury, England, as captured on home video. The researchers who shot this tape believe it is evidence that the British government is involved in secret crop circle research. Watch carefully as the helicopter hovers near a mysterious ball of light in the middle of your screen. In the field below, a crop circle. The crop circle activity in this area this year has been quite considerable. We have something in the region of 100 major patterns in Great Britain currently. Uh, over 90% of them are in this area once again. Some of the crop circles are made by, in my view, extraterrestrials. When you study the material over the last 40 years from many countries, um, you have solid metallic looking objects landing, taking off leaving a characteristic uh, ground feature like a, an ordinary crop circle. It was like a, a clear sphere, but orange in, inside, with like thousands of lights spinning and rotating, and the whole thing was spinning. Most of the lights that are seen above the crop formations, and some of them are actually seen in the fields, there must be some connection, although at the present we haven't got that little thing that clicks the two together. Every night, sky watchers ring the hills around Avebury, waiting for a glimpse of the mysterious lights. The following amateur videotapes of unexplained lights in the night sky have all been taken within the last three years. It was only very short-lived, but for the five seconds it was there, it was tremendous. It was like looking at, at uh, something half the size of the moon, just sat on the ridge top, brilliantly glowing orange. They looked like orange balls of light, you could see that they were mushroom shaped, revolving uh, and emitting orange lights out from the bottom. So we were quite fascinated by it. I'd describe it as being spherical, uh, oval shaped, uh, silvery white, slight orange tinge. It came over from the left to the right of the trees, then it went back, then it came back again, then all of a sudden it looked like it tripled in size and changed colour to orange. But then after that, we see the, the white ball came out from the side of it. And that went off to the left, and we never see that no more. The lights are there, and they're not aircraft, planets, or radio towers. But are they extraterrestrial craft? Most astronomers believe the Avebury mystery lights are a natural phenomenon, but so far, they don't know much more than that. At the heart of a lot of genuine sightings of, of UFOs uh, are these balls of light cavorting around in the night sky, perhaps coming down very close, perhaps changing shape. It's quite possible that those balls of light are a glowing plasma. 
which is the same type mechanism that we do think is involved in crop circle formation. Plasma being very simply electrically charged air particles. And they start high in the Earth's atmosphere and come down towards the ground. So if you have plasma coming from high in the Earth's atmosphere, you should expect that it's likely to be swirling by the time it gets anywhere near the ground. And that's completely consistent with what we find in crop circles. It is just conceivable that uh, some of the circles may result from uh, balls of light that just touch down and touch this very responsive surface of a, of a cornfield. The ground here is chalk and limestone, crisscrossed with underground springs. Some scientists hypothesize that the interaction between the water and the rock creates an electrical charge that either attracts or helps create the lights. But what is so strange is that these lights appear to be moving purposefully. And that's, for me, what sets it aside from the natural phenomena to one which may well be controlled by an intelligence of some sort, or indeed in itself may well be intelligent. I turned and I saw this glint and I thought, what's that? And automatically, almost, I picked my video camera up. On July 26th, 1990, crop circle researcher Stephen Alexander captured this remarkable footage of one of the mysterious earth lights in a field near Avebury. The earth light was maneuvering next to a newly formed crop circle. And this object just actually curved round and dropped into the crop and disappeared for a while. And then it started maneuvering through the crop, and it was glinting and flashing. It was a really intense sort of energy source, it seemed to me. Where's it gone? Then you can see the object actually take off. And in the distance was a tractor driver. And uh, you can actually see the tractor driver stop as the actual object went over the top there. Where is that piece of paper? I couldn't explain it. In the back of my mind, I knew it wasn't a bird or a balloon or just something blowing in the wind. Um, I knew that it was something important there. This videotape of another Earth light above Avebury was taken from a hang glider by Dutch UFO researcher Foka Kuja. But scientists and ufologists may not be the only ones interested in these lights. It appears that the British military is also studying the phenomenon. That is quite you. Look at that. Look at these bristling yeah. with equipment. Right, we get this here. We get a picture of him in front of that. Okay. Oh, yeah. What appeared to be happening was that we had moved, walked into a situation which was undesirable because what happened was that the two army helicopters approached us and appeared to be harassing us. I mean, he was so close, it was unbelievable. One helicopter broke away across this field to the far side of the field to my left and what you can see on the film is a small white object pulsating, identical to Stephen Alexander's, very similar to the Dutch uh, people's footage and others. And this helicopter went directly to the light which we could see on the footage. Some flashing thing on the ground. He's wandering right on the right now. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Does that move? It overshot it. The helicopter you can see backing up to get this back into full view as this white light is pulsating underneath it. And on film, this light uh, just disappears. But once again, on film, we have something we cannot explain. If the lights are simply a natural phenomenon, why would the British military be involved? If the lights are nothing more than concentrations of superheated energy, how could they create these intricate designs? These things are seen to move from one pattern to another. They appear to have total awareness of their surroundings. And on occasions, we have many reports of an interactiveness between the people who are observing them. Uh, and so therefore, for me, that puts it into a slightly different slot. We're looking at what might be intelligence. He's moving right on right now. The British Ministry of Defense has stated that the helicopters in Colin Andrews' videotape were on a training exercise and that no one involved with the exercise saw anything unusual that day. According to the Defense Ministry, the pulsing white object is simply a reflection from the helicopter's strobe light. Coming up, startling new theories suggest that there is a missing link in the story of human evolution. Don't call them aliens. 
because we look like them, they look like us. When Charles Darwin published Origin of the Species in 1859, it ignited a worldwide controversy that continues to divide science and religion. But the controversy doesn't end there, because within the scientific community itself, there is bitter division. And now, new evidence that a conspiracy of silence among mainstream anthropologists is covering up evidence of what some believe are our true extraterrestrial origins. The Bible answers the riddle of our origin in four simple words, and God created man. Darwin looked at monkeys and saw Michelangelo. But for modern anthropologists who try to put a name and a date to the dawn of humankind, the answer is constantly changing. Fossils discovered recently in Ethiopia put our earliest ancestors at around 4.4 million years, but some scientists believe that there is evidence that we are much older than that. On an archaeological dig in Huayotlico, Mexico, Dr. Virginia Steen McIntyre discovered tools that predated the earliest known humans. Her find created a storm of controversy. I don't really want to be in the center of a controversy. I never asked to be in the center of a controversy, but I'm here. And um, doggone it, I, I want to get the information out. I want to get at the truth. I guess that's what it is. Why does Dr. Steen McIntyre feel the need to protect her artifacts from her more mainstream colleagues? Why are contradictory findings being met with contempt instead of excitement? Some researchers charge it's because these new findings would turn modern anthropology on its head. I believe that we came from outer space. All the evidence suggests that human beings as we know them did not originate on this planet, but have come to this Earth from other dimensions. I believe that we came from outer space, that we are the direct descendants of the intelligent people who landed here a long time ago. Gene Phillips is the founder and president of the Ancient Astronaut Society. He claims that museums are hiding thousands of artifacts that do not conform to their narrow view of anthropology. This is a, an exact replica of uh, an object that uh, is in the Smithsonian Museum, and they call it a stylized insect. The Smithsonian had it on display, and they used to sell replicas in their shop. Phillips claims that after the Ancient Astronaut Society interpreted the object as a prehistoric space shuttle, the Smithsonian removed the original from public display. Phillips and his group have studied more than 150 ancient sites in 30 countries. These 5,000-year-old masks were unearthed in Eastern Europe. They bear a striking resemblance to modern-day depictions of supposed aliens, known as greys. There's a, a site in Bolivia, South America, called El Fuerte. What it looks like is a catapult-type launch site for space vehicles. The Ancient Astronaut Society is not the only group supporting the theory of interplanetary contact. Author Zachariah Sitchin concurs in his book, The Twelfth Planet. And there is one more planet in our own solar system, not light years away, that comes uh, near Earth between Mars and Jupiter every 3,600 years, at which time people, intelligent people, beings like us, come and go between their planet and our planet and brought us homo sapiens about sooner than we might have appeared otherwise. Don't call them aliens because we look like them, they look like us. See, all we ask is that people have an open mind. Look at something with an open mind with today's space age eyes. Scientists on the fringe of modern anthropology believe that their theories are not taken seriously because mainstream scientists are afraid to admit that they've been wrong. All the textbooks would have to be rewritten. All the exhibits in the museums would have to be changed. This would be very embarrassing. And people who have positions to defend like that don't like to be embarrassed. The idea of alien evolution does sound far-fetched, and its proponents are well aware of the fact that they're looked at as eccentric outsiders. They may not have all the answers, but it's often the so-called eccentrics who ask the most interesting questions. 
Next, they call him the recomposer of the decomposed, and he solved another case. The payoff emotionally is helping to put some of these cases to rest. Recently, sightings profiled forensic sculptor Frank Bender. His uncanny gift for sculpting a human face on the bare bones of an unidentified skull has brought closure to many unsolved murder cases. And now, because of our original broadcast, another family can put a long-lost loved one to rest. In 1980, police made a grisly discovery in a row house on North Lithgow Street in Philadelphia. The body they found was badly decomposed and bore no resemblance to the young woman she once was. That's where forensic sculptor Frank Bender comes in. He has an uncanny gift for creating a face on a bare skull, for giving life, if only in clay, to the victims of unsolved crimes. His studio is the final resting place for men, women, and children who have no names. Bender's technique combines forensic science with an emotional, some call it psychic, attachment. And it works. On a previous sightings, we profiled Bender and his amazing success rate. After the first segment of sightings aired, I received numerous phone calls from people all around the country basically saying that they were thanking sightings and also thanking me and the team involved for the work that we're doing. And now, the woman who Frank Bender resurrected from a skull found on North Lithgow Street has a name. The wondering and waiting are over for one Philadelphia family. After 15 years, they know what happened to Jackie. All these years, I never moved because I thought maybe she would come home. Never changed my phone number. Everything's been the same. Just in case, she would reach out, as they say, and phone home. Because of our broadcast, Frank Bender met police officer Virginia Hill, who works in the missing persons unit of the Philadelphia Police Department. Officer Hill inherited the Jackie Goff case three years ago. The search for Jacqueline Go started with me in 1991. The first time Officer Hill visited Frank Bender's studio, she was struck by the resemblance between Jackie Goff and one of the busts Bender had sculpted. I came over to his studio and we talked about it on a, a, a show that he was doing. And we put two and two together and we both believed the same that it was Jacqueline. Forensic evidence supported the matchup. Jackie's dental records indicated she had an extra tooth. So did the skull that Bender had worked from. A photo of the bust was given to the Goff family. They made positive ID. From here up. I would almost have to say positively that it was. Frank has never met Jackie, but when he made this, it seemed like he knew her when he made it, because that looks like her through her eyes, top part of her face. DNA results are still pending, but Frank Bender is confident he has made another match. The payoff emotionally is satisfaction, the satisfaction of helping, helping to put some of these cases to rest. Officer Hill is continuing to work with Frank Bender on other missing persons cases. The future is promising. I work with families that are in great distress. A lot of families haven't uh, heard from their children in 10, 15, even 20 years. And I get a, a lot of relief when a family has put it to rest, when we can positively identify someone and then they can go on with their lives. Sadly, the bust that Frank Bender was sculpting during our original broadcast has still not been identified. Here, again, is the face of an unnamed child found murdered in Philadelphia in 1994. If you have any information about the identity of this little boy, believed to be five years old at the time of his death, please contact the Homicide Division of the Philadelphia Police Department. Coming up. You can hear people screaming. Are dangerous spirits haunting this historic site? It was like walking into a ghost party. Then, a child's tragic premonition. And this computer document may prove that we are not alone. 1849, 
The gold rush is on. More than 85,000 people flock to California in search of the mother load. A few become millionaires, but most barely scratch out a living. And many of the legendary 49ers die, laboring with hand tools inside unstable mines. It is the ghosts of those who died trying that many believe are still here today, haunting a small town in the Sierra foothills of California. You can hear explosions. You can hear fire crackling. You can hear people screaming. In California's gold country, the mines are idle now. The streams and creeks played out. But in Jamestown, the spirit of the 49ers is still alive inside this hotel. You can still find a hot meal and friendly conversation at the Willow Hotel. And some people believe you can still hear strange echoes from the past. I went into the bathroom, went to turn the light on, and something touched me on the back of my hand. I've seen spices fly off the shelves. Laughter in the kitchen when no one's there. Ceiling fans coming on by themselves. Lights in here constantly going on and off. Why does the Willow Hotel seem to be the focus of so much haunting activity? Many people believe it's because of a great mine disaster that killed 23 miners here in 1862. Before the dust had settled, construction began in the Willow Hotel. It was built directly on top of the mine where so many had lost their lives. Jamestown tried to put the past behind it. The hotel thrived, hosting presidents and gunslingers. But the past did not go away. There's a lot of good here, but there's a lot of evil also. The Willow Saloon has been in constant operation since 1862, but for the past 10 years, no one has slept here. A series of mysterious fires have engulfed the sleeping quarters three separate times, and always on the same date in years ending in five, July 21st, 1955, July 21st, 1975. When the hotel burned on July 21st, 1985, no one wanted to rebuild. We smelled smoke all day. And then later that evening, there was, we spotted flames in the wainscoting over in the dining room. When the fire department came, they chopped the wall up and went through it and everything. And inside the wall, there was no electrical. There was nothing there to make that fire start. It just had started like um, from nothing. Then after we got the fire put out, then Kevin, the owner, asked us to stick around just in case it reignited. And at that time, we started hearing two scratches from underneath the bar floor by the waitress station. I took a fast exit out the door, and then shortly after that, out of this wall that I'm leaning against came like two massive exhales. Word spread about the strange fires at the Willow. A local news crew came in to conduct an overnight surveillance. We set the camera back on the tripod, and we left it just sitting there. Nobody touched it, and the um, camera went to black and white, and uh, we had, elect you know, electrical was blinking in and out, and um, the walls of the booth in, in the front there started rolling as if like an earthquake, you know, was making the walls roll out. We did play it back. Yeah, we had it lines going across it and then it started rolling, and then ever since then I haven't been able to really view it. It kept um, Our VCR. shutting the VCR off, ejecting the tape, and it was a brand new tape. That same television crew took these photographs and claimed they saw transparent entities hiding in the shadows. I just looked across the room and I just saw somebody standing at the booth. And as soon as I got up, he just disappeared. He was gone. That was the reason why I took a picture of the booth to see what would happen. And then it appears that there are two faces in the booth, one on each side. And one of the faces looks like he has like a miner's hat. Are these entities somehow responsible for the fires? Do they have a connection to the great Jamestown fire of 1896 that destroyed almost everything but the willow? In the late 1800s, when the town was burning and they dynamited some of the other buildings to save this one, they said while they were dynamiting, a man was killed, and they said one of the kinfolk from the man that was killed is who keeps lighting this place on fire. Or is the haunting here related to the turbulent times the Willow experienced during Prohibition? In 1925, Gus Ratto, who was leasing the bar at the time, went upstairs to his wife's room and called to her. And when she opened the door, he fired one shot into her head and turned around and shot another into his own head. 
Since 1972, the place has belonged to the Mooney family. When Kevin Mooney took over four years ago, he was a confirmed skeptic until he had his own sighting. I'm getting ready to walk through the back door when I look up at the window and there's eyes like red like this, two red eyes looking through the window. And I just, my heart started going, oh God. I get outside, my heart's boom, boom, boom. I look around, there's nothing there. The Moonies had earlier contacted parapsychologists Nick Nosarino and Chuck Pelton to conduct a thorough investigation. You got something here that's very hot. Very hot. This is where the apparition should be. If, the, if there's going to be an apparition, it should be in this area. When you walk through this building, you still feel heat, you feel fire, you smell smoke. Pelton and Nosarino believe that there are three layers of hauntings here, caused by what they have termed residual thought forms. Well, thought form is, is probably an event that took place uh, that these people are reliving. And if you tie that into a quick death, had it been from a fire explosion, a mine cave in, it's, it's even possible these people don't know that they're dead. No one can predict if the haunting forms of the past will appear again. But you can bet everyone in Jamestown will be keeping an eye on the willow every July 21st, ending in five. The pattern of fires occurring on the same date nearly every decade since 1955 has all the earmarks of a classic arson pattern. That's what the Tuolumne County Fire Department originally thought. But their extensive investigation has ruled out arson as a possible cause. When sightings continues, a child's premonition turns tragedy into hope. Katie was given a glimpse from the other side. Most psychical researchers believe that we are born with extraordinary powers of ESP, but as we grow older, our psychic ability is weakened by a world that teaches us to rely on empirical thinking. If this is true, it might help explain why young Katie Thronson had a premonition of death that tragically came true. This is the last picture Katie Thronson ever drew. It was her vision of another life beyond this one it seemed to spring from an active imagination. But less than a week after Katie showed the drawing to her mother, the little girl, who seemed heaven sent, was gone. Katie was a beautiful little girl who was really happy and was always kissing people, just really loving. She would always have her arms around other children. Um, she seemed to be uh, the one that always brought children together. Over the course of almost seven years, she had hundreds of drawings. She expressed herself by drawing hearts all the time because she was filled with love. Julie Thronson vividly recalls one day in October of 1991 when Katie came to her out of the blue with an unsettling question. She came into the room where I was sitting holding a tablet that she had been drawing on and in a real innocent way came up to me and asked me, Mommy, am I going to die? And I said, no, honey, of course not. You're not going to die. And she said, never. And I said, Katie, no, you're not going to die. Then she just danced off, happy that she wasn't going to die. But two days later, Katie developed what appeared to be a severe flu. The next day, her condition worsened, and she was rushed to the hospital. Doctors suspected that Katie had a ruptured appendix. In the hours after that time, uh, and prior to her going to surgery, uh, her prognosis uh, had uh, become extremely grave. Julie never left her daughter's side. Just before 3 o'clock, while Katie was awaiting surgery, there was a change in her breathing. She lapsed into unconsciousness, and Julie could not wake her. I said, Katie, Katie, just talk to Mama. And she, she wasn't responding to me at all. And I looked at the clock, and it was right at 3 o'clock. 
I looked at the clock, I looked at her, and suddenly she just sat up in the hospital bed, raised her arms out towards the window, opened her eyes. It was like she wanted me to pick her up, yet she wasn't in my direction. There was this stillness in the room that is indescribable. It was just completely still. It was like an infinite moment. And in my spirit, I just knew that my little girl had been taken. And I ran out into the, into the hall and I, I just yelled, my little girl just died. I just saw her die. A medical team rushed in to try to revive Katie. Julie waited in the hallway, just outside the room where her daughter was dying. And then I noticed a pregnant woman walking towards me. And I could tell by the look in her eyes that she was going to say something to me. And she came right up to me. Uh, she touched me on the shoulder. And she said, the Lord has spoken to me. You're to be like a lioness. Your little girl is OK. And I just felt this shiver go through my body. And I thought, if the Lord has spoken to her, then Katie is OK. Whether she's going to live or whether she's gone to God, Katie's going to be OK. The woman disappeared as if into thin air, and Julie never saw her again. Katie was being kept alive with machines. After three days, doctors pronounced her legally brain dead. The Thronsons made the agonizing decision to remove life support. The autopsy indicated that there was indeed appendicitis and that there had been extension of this infection locally to other organs uh, that were nearby. Officially, Katie died October 10th, but both Julie and her doctor believed Katie was gone much sooner. When I told the doctor that at that time she had raised her arms out towards the window, he said, I believe that that was the time that Katie left her body. And that although they artificially kept her alive, she had died at 3 o'clock. It was six-year-old Katie who was the first to be laid to rest in the family plot. It was an unspeakable tragedy from which the Thronsons never thought they would recover. But a few months later, there was a ray of hope stuffed inside a cardboard box. Julie found the tablet that Katie had been drawing on just days before her death. She had drawn a picture of these angels surrounding a light and uh, the cloud and the moon had sad faces, and all the angels had sad faces, and some of them even had tears coming down their face. The picture said everything. When I saw it, I knew without a doubt that Katie had a premonition. Julie drew strength from that cherished drawing. Then, five months after Katie's death, a picture appeared in Life magazine that seemed to confirm Julie's belief that her daughter's drawing was a premonition. This 19th century engraving was part of an article about life after death. The depiction of a welcoming vortex of light was strikingly similar to Katie's own vision. Both pictures have a circular pattern that resembles the tunnel of light commonly reported in near-death experiences. Coincidence? Or did Katie receive a divine message? She knew she was going to die. She drew that picture. She asked me, Mommy, am I going to die? Whether or not she knew the meaning of it, I believe her spirit did. Author Dr. Gerald Jampulski is a child psychiatrist who counsels bereaved families. After Julie Thronson saw the Life magazine article, she wrote to Dr. Jampulski and asked him to look at Katie's drawing. I pointed out that at uh, 3 o'clock, uh, it looked like one of the angels was going toward the, toward the center, going toward the light. I was like amazed for a minute. And he continued, but I'm thinking, he doesn't know 
that Katie died at 3 o'clock. There's no way he could know that. Julie also tried to find the pregnant woman who had comforted her. The hospital gave her the names and phone numbers of all the women in the maternity ward that day, but none of them remembered speaking to Julie. She was obviously an angel. There was some kind of a message there of life and death and birth. The cycle of death and birth continues. There is a new life in the Thronson family. Little Cody was born on October 7th, 1992, one year to the day after Katie died. It was an uncanny coincidence. I was once told a definition of coincidence that I've always found very helpful. A coincidence is a miracle in which God wishes to remain anonymous. That makes a lot of sense to me. When the Thronsons take Katie's brothers and sisters to her grave, the family remembers and talks about what they believe is God's plan. It was a gift from beyond, maybe a gift from God. The impact that drawing has had on our life is just beyond words. We have this to share with people. We have the hope to share with people that there is a beautiful side to all of this. It helped us in the healing because it, it, it gave us both peace. I felt honored that Katie was given a glimpse from the other side. There's just the, the fact that there's life after death. And even though we can't see it, it exists. Just a few weeks ago, the Thronsons were in a serious car accident. Fortunately, everyone's all right. They're recovering at home. But something strange happened during that crash. Three-year-old Christopher told his mother and father that right after the moment of impact, he saw Katie. Up next. It was uh, five to six times stronger than any signal in the past. After receiving what could be an extraterrestrial message, this facility could be shut down. The radio telescope at Ohio State University in Columbus is nicknamed the Big Ear. Its job is to listen for anomalous sounds in the cosmos that might be evidence of intergalactic communication. If someone out there is trying to get our attention, the Big Ear is probably the telescope that will bring the message to us. Man has always wondered, uh, are we alone in the universe? Are there other intelligent beings somewhere that we might uh, perhaps converse with at some point, or at least learn of the existence of? The universe has no beginning, no middle, and no end. In such a limitless ocean of planets, moons, and stars, are we really the only life form searching outer space? Is another civilization trying to make contact? Astronomers operating this telescope believe contact has been made. It was exactly the kind of signal that we are looking for. It's a narrow band signal, clearly of intelligent origin, clearly not interference, not any of those things. In the late 1950s, Ohio State University began construction on what would become the world's largest radio telescope. It was designed to pick up and record the noises of space. And for over 15 years, it cataloged a symphony of static pops and hisses that were emanating naturally from satellites, stars, and explainable sources. Then, in the mid-1970s, the radio telescope known as the Big Ear received NASA sponsorship and began listening for evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. In 1977, they got their first hit. I had the task to look at the computer printouts to see if there was anything interesting. Anything for or above was definitely unusual. Well, this was the equivalent of 30, and so it was so strong uh, five to six times stronger than I had seen any signal in the past that I was astonished and immediately wrote the word wow exclamation point in the margin of the computer printout. The very strange thing is we have these two beams in the sky. We saw it in only one of those beams. So that means that it turned off or on one or the other as we were watching it, which is even further indication of intelligent origin. The tantalizing thing is we went back and looked hundreds of times later and it was never there again. So we will never know exactly what that was. It could have been from some other civilization. The spontaneous signal became known as the Big Wow. It immediately sparked serious debate among astronomers. No one could explain the origin of the signal, but many scientists would not accept it as proof of intergalactic communication. 
Others insisted the Big Wow was Earth's first contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence. The debate continues to this day. The fundamental problem in a scientific experiment is if you can't repeat it, it probably, you, you can't say it exists. Dr. Lewis Friedman does not believe that the Big Wow is definitive proof of interstellar communication. But he does believe it is an important piece of a larger puzzle that the Big Ear will someday solve. Nonetheless, it has, over the, over the time, made very useful observations in the, uh, in the whole search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But despite the Big Ear's scientific contributions, the radio telescope's future is on shaky ground. Congress did cut out the funding uh, last year, and that has made the SETI program really disappear from all government activities. Because the subject deals with extraterrestrial life, it's a subject that is obviously capable of ridicule. And Congress uh, didn't uh, continue the funding because they were susceptible to those kinds of jokes. Unfortunately, the land the Big Ear sits on is becoming more valuable than the radio telescope itself. Without federal funding, it's up to private organizations like the Planetary Society to stave off destruction of the project. The idea that someone out there may be transmitting and we're not listening is not one that we in the Planetary Society are comfortable with. Currently, everyone who works on the project works for free. The Big Air is supported by volunteers who don't want to see the project die. We have people from all walks of life. I mean, we have an attorney, we have physicists, astronomers, a chemist, school teachers, a jukebox repairman, people who just do anything that you can imagine to volunteer here. The Planetary Society encourages anyone with an interest in the heavens to join them. Volunteers who aren't physicists or astronomers learn from those who are. If it weren't for someone like me coming up and moving, repointing the telescope a couple times a week, then no such survey uh, would be done. Their equipment is sadly outdated, but the big ear volunteers are undaunted. Who knows when one of them will be able to write wow on a computer printout. There's no telling what um, extraterrestrial civilization's power is, so even the weakest equipment might be able to pick something up. Eventually they will transmit, and I think we'll hear it. If not in my lifetime, then the next one. It seems unlikely that only here, in this very typical place, that life would have formed. In fact, if we go on searching for a long period of time and never find anything, that will be an even stranger situation. But we will have to then understand why did life form only here and nowhere else. We want the Earth to be listening. We have a lot to learn in this area. Who knows where we'll strike a, a little gold in those hills. The land underneath the Big Ear is leased to Ohio State by a land development corporation. The university's 10-year lease expires next year. And there are rumors that when it does, one of the world's tallest radio telescopes will be dismantled to make way for a golf course. Sightings has expanded its America Online area. Keyword sightings when you log on for access to sighting stories, images, and events. To subscribe to America Online, call 1-800-591-3344. And you can still reach sightings 24 hours a day at 1-900-933-7444. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For sightings, I'm Tim White. Next on Sci-Fi, The Sentinel. One more wish is all this creature needs. Careful what you wish for. From Wes Craven, Wishmaster. Wednesday at 9 p.m. on Sci-Fi.